Yo, what is up? Welcome to Dost Cast. My name is Vinamra Kasana. I host this podcast, and we release new episodes every Tuesday and Friday. So make sure you check it out. Make sure you subscribe. If you're listening on audio, make sure you are following us on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, wherever you listen to podcasts, so you never miss an update. Having said that, this episode I had the privilege, the honor of hosting Manu Joseph on the podcast, who's the author of The Illicit Happiness of Other People. serious men miss lela armed and dangerous he also writes weekly columns on mint and in this episode we talk about his latest series on netflix called decoupled which is making waves across india stars r madhavan and surveen chavla as a couple who's undergoing a divorce um manu and i sat down and talk talk for almost 2 hours about the behind the scenes of this series um stylistic choices he made um how the woke of this country are trying to cancel him then we also talked about a stuff a bunch of stuff that you guys will love especially around his writing routine what he thinks about notes advice for young writers and a whole lot of other things that annoy him and arya ayer the protagonist of uh, decoupled uh that make it such a wonderful series to watch so i'm sure uh you will enjoy the conversation as well the episode with manu joseph begins in 3 2 1 All right, it's taken a while to get to this. How's it going, Manu Joseph? Um, the couple has been uh, making the waves all across the country on Twitter, on the internet. People are citing rave reviews. One thing I wanted to start off with straight off the bat is usually, I mean, the the approach you took with Serious Men is you had a novel out, and then it became a movie. This time there isn't really a novel. It's just you writing a script and then you know making stuff happen with Netflix. Why? Why did you take that decision? Oh, it's not a decision. It is uh, uh, novels are not the only thing I write. Hmm. Uh, I I've always enjoyed writing screenplays. Uh, in my twenties, in fact, the scaffolding my training for as a novelist is actually screenplay. Hmm. Uh, it's just that those days, I mean, I would write and uh, no, nothing would nothing would come out of it. You know, so. so uh, so it, and uh, so it's not exactly an alien medium for me it's something which i knew i could do i've even written a play um so uh, so uh, so yeah so uh, it was not anything unnatural for me you know hmm. uh what i always enjoyed about writing a screenplay uh long before i wrote decoupled was that there's something playful about this medium I'm not a playful novelist in the sense that I may, I may appear to be playful and light, but I'm not a play. I, I take my, you know, I take myself very seriously as a novelist, and it's a very complex way of storytelling. It may not appear all the time. Like for example, after eight, ten hours of work in a day, I would have written five hundred words, six hundred words. You know, so that is the mm-hmm. pace of a novel. You know, and I'm not someone who wastes too much time. Uh, so it's it's uh, so but the screenplay uh it's not that it's more fun or less work uh but it has a layer of humility uh in it you know which i'm not able to place maybe it is because you have to collaborate with so many people in the making and then you have to reach out and because it's always so expensive compared to a novel uh there is a creative humility about it probably which makes it easier for the writer also to be a bit playful right right um i i i said that because i feel when uh, you're an author or a writer or as film students often call directors who do everything auteurs um that you have complete control over the final product here i mean you're working with hardik mehta and netflix and madhavan and surveen and others um So there's a bunch of inputs happening. There's collaboration happening. Are there things that you had to let go uh, from your original vision to make this happen? And if if that incites any stories, could you yeah. tell me about that? See, generally, I'm uh, I'm someone who can't write without freedom. So the larger mm. thing is all already negotiated. You know, the larger freedom. You know, mm. and after that, I am very open to uh, to uh, to suggestions and improvements and great ideas and things. things like that you know and of course to ask you to answer your specific questions yes you know some uh, i was willing to let go let go of some things and uh, yes i had to go th- through the stage of persuasion you know i'm not someone who'll just walk out of the room saying it's just there's only one way of doing it you know yeah. uh 
um, because I have been an editor, because I've been a journalist, and people forget that journalism is half corporate profession because you work in a corporate shell, right? right. Uh, so, for, so I, I'm very used to uh, uh, negotiation and and persuasion and. Um, uh, listening to arguments against it, and I'm very happy to defend <coughs> my work hmm. you know, to people who matter the most to me, you know, especially in a project like this. So, uh, but one interesting thing about this uh, this project, decoupled, is that either people immediately got it, you know, hmm. within five seconds when I would just say it, and or they would never get it, right? You know, so they never get why. Um, why everybody else is finding it funny and why it's interesting or why it is special, you know, why is this guy suggesting it, you know. Uh, so uh, I always, right from the beginning of the project till now, okay, where um, people, uh, you know, are trying to understand it, it's it's been the case. But I'm happy to note that a majority of people are, are people who just immediately get it. Hmm. Yeah, um, one thing surprising about the series, if we dive straight, in, straight into the plot, is um, usually I have seen people divorcing around myself, um, and I have seen a bunch of divorce movies. And I know you wrote something for the for the Mint around divorce films a while ago, <clears throat> but in this series, like the, this divorce almost feels like a breeze. I mean, there's internal tension happening, but over the span of what eight episodes, you have this couple couple always, always just slowly accepting their fate that they're gonna divorce without any stormy fights or, or you know like how people are devastated when when their marriage ends. That doesn't happen at all. And I was very surprised to see there's there's a there's an inner there's a underlying serenity. In both parties yeah. about how about how this is happening yeah. was that deliberate did you want to switch over from the usual tropes around divorce movies no this happens in a, in a, this is a phase uh, of separation hmm. where you know the, the all those battles and the storms uh, are over and hmm. you have the scars and uh, people use the word friends because uh, I, th I think Friendship is a very abused word because it's such an elevated relationship. And uh, uh, but but there is something to that word in uh, the post storm relationship of a separating couple. You know because mm. um, uh, it is a very unique position for them to be in. You know, and that's exactly what where I wanted them to be in. You know. Mm. And uh, uh, and I, I just don't enjoy bitterness, especially even though I feel that comedy emerges from very high stakes and trauma hmm. and intensity. Um, I don't like, I don't enjoy the bitterness of a couple squabbling, you know. It's the most boring thing on earth. In fact, I, Kundera, Milan Kundera, a writer I like. Yes once observed that, uh, you know, in one of this European philosophical way that uh, in, in, I mean, uh, in, I, I don't remember the exact line, but anyway, I mean, his, his prose would have been translated because he doesn't write in English. Yeah. That life uh, is scary because there is no rehearsal, okay? That it is like a play where you just come and you start playing your role without any rehearsal. While marriage proves that he's completely wrong. What happens in a marriage every day is that you're, you're doing the same things. And right. uh, in fact, the quarrels are also the same. That's why couples are so good at quarreling hmm. and they're unbearable to listen to, Okay, even if you're one of the two parties, because it's the same. You know, they have the same six complaints. They have the same eight arguments, but they get better and better at the quarrels. That's why I think they quarrel, you know. Right. They, uh, so because they have, they've got a new argument and then their guy will okay, think of another argument. So they're just good at quarreling. So it's like a rehearsal of a very boring play after, after a point, right? Um, and I was not, uh, I mean, there's a lot of interesting things can come out of it. Hmm. And the second trap I avoided is like, why? It was very tempting for everybody. It's like, why did they split? Why did they split, right? So I feel that that is another, 
uh, unconvincing thing about a marriage. Hmm. You know, when people give reasons, you know. In fact, we are a world which is fooled by reasons. You know, if someone commits suicide, you get obsessed with a reason. You know, you say, you, you brand something called farmer suicide. Okay, we'll come to that, all that later. We brand, okay, if you are a 16-year-old and if you're studying, okay, it must be uh, edu- uh, something related to education. If you're a farmer, it must be the farming policy. It must be this. So reasons are very corrupt ways in which we try to understand our world. And, and I have absolutely no faith in couples who give give you reasons why they separated, you know. Yeah. And usually the, the underlying reasons are all the same, unless one was a maniac, you know, that's a different issue. So the underlying reasons are almost the same, you know. And uh, I, I, well, I could have gone that way. It would be interesting, but... I did, there were like one of the early drafts, there is a bit of this and that. And then I thought it's so boring compared to what they're going through right now. You know, so boring. It's like, you know. Right. So, uh, yeah. Yeah, I feel like uh, there's this thing in communication theory where, it's, I think it's, it's called attribution theory, where people, they do something and they attribute a certain cause to it. And then, then that's how they, they say, ye isle hua because of so and so. And um, it's a very convenient way to, do away with the discomfort of not knowing and i think in the entire series this when i when i watched the entire thing i was like is there going to be a happy ending at all can i can i at least hope that by some miraculous uh twist and turn we're going to arrive at a place where this couple realizes you know what maybe we should give this another shot but then as the series goes on i'm not going to reveal the ending uh, you really arrive at this place in a marriage where um it's just done and dusted and there's no way you can you know go past it and um nowadays uh, people are more okay with the uh, morally ambiguous endings and and uh, quote unquote gray areas and i just wanted to ask you um did anyone in the creative team of netflix or even hardik for that matter insist on a different kind of ending insist on things uh you know taking a slight turn than what is originally uh, shown in the series actually because because of the nature of our relationship there was no, nobody insisted on anything but hmm. there were many options i myself had you know right. uh, so some of them would have been pretty bad when i think about it if the creative team you know like hardik and uh, the uh, and netflix and the producer sejal shah uh had not dissuaded me you know yeah. um because because it was funny because i was the only guy who really didn't care so much about the story you know to to me the uh the heart of the series was in the many arcs you know the many small arcs and the ideas and many other things and uh, m- I felt that once, and the character, of course, the characters. You know, mm. To me, characters are everything. Once you like the character, actually, they can do anything, and you'll be okay with it. You know, except death, you'll be fine. Even that, in some cases, you know. Um, so I always look. I, I I have I have this probably an issue, but I won't change. I look at plot as a farcical thing. It's farce. But even in a comedy, everything else is, to me, very serious, you know. Uh, so in this farce, I can, because it's so easy for me to fix it. Maybe story is a difficult thing for most people and they think that yeah. uh, it's something which is important and they work. Or I, I, I can just, for, for me, a story is the easiest. I mean, sto- uh, you know, it's, it's a trick, you know. That's not why I write, right? So it could have gone either way. So then I... I looked at the reaction of people, how much they were invested in the characters and what is going to happen to them, the fate of the characters. Then I was, uh, okay, so I thought, okay, I should think more deeply about uh, this uh, fate, which seems to interest everybody, you know. Mm. And uh, maybe I'm looking at it in a very unsentimental way, you know, uh, that the present of the character is what is important to me while the fate of the character all seems to be uh, as important to other people you know so i thought okay now uh, when when things are not clear i'll try try to lean on logic you know 
because uh, logic is narrow. You know, everything else is so broad in life, you know. Mm, logic is the only thing that we have where there are not that many options, you know. That's why I look at even morality as a form of logic, you know. Um, so then uh, then I thought, uh, I mean, I, I came up with some options and Tanya and Karishma from Netflix, you know, so they, they, had, they had many thoughts on it. And of course, Hardik and uh, Sejal Shah and Babish Mandalia, all these people were totally involved in the in 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 the in in the reactions to the various ends that we had and and it was not a uniform uh, opinion hmm. you know but uh, the, uh, so so in the end uh, uh, we in fact we uh, we shot uh, uh, you know we we, we we shot different kinds of endings also you know oh, that, the but not intentionally in, hmm. not intentionally so uh, uh yeah so in the end uh what what how, how the series ended uh was a result of a post production creativity you know so I see. <laughs> we had the story and then we were looking at various things that are, that are happening and there were some practical elements also that we had to take you know uh into consideration so uh, so see that's what so it kind of supports my theory which i had even right in the beginning that the story to which people react so forcefully is so farcical compared to the other things which have been created with so much care and expressed exactly the way they were intended to right right so but wouldn't you say that um in in this actually let me take this differently there's a an entire reference several referrals to netflix in a series made by netflix and i know this is happening in 2021 it happened last year as well where it's kind of become like a an urban dictionary word it's 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 found its way in our dictionary it's found a, found its way in our lives um what was that like referencing the very uh, producers creators of the show <laughs> inside the show does that maybe help get some creative license as to since netflix is supporting the the views the opinions of the characters inside the show uh it's kind of uh, okay see uh i ha- i have a i have a theory in storytelling that uh, when you know what you're lying about you should make everything else very authentic hmm. okay and there is no reason and there is no reason why you should not tell the truths about other things or make other things look very real uh when when you know that they can be you know basically we are in the business of telling the truth but because it's fiction you need to lie about something central so that you can tell the truths about other things correct that's all mm. that's all we do so our characters are fiction the story never happened but everything else i want to be as real as possible right so i thought calling netflix you know in, instead of creating a fabricated name Hmm. for uh, an ott platform because for legal reasons we would have had to do that right right uh, a, a a platform that doesn't exist you yeah. know instead of that i thought you know it would be for example if netflix had a problem i would have probably asked one of the other otts you know can we use your name you know right. and uh, this is the context and uh, you know uh, in fact i uh, in one of my novels i had uh, a portion where i'm making fun of arundhati roy a bit i actually mailed her and asked her, can i can i you know do this you know yeah <laughs> um so um, so yeah so that is the genesis of it and uh, there was a kind of a uh, i understood that from a creative point of view i would be constricted a bit because every it was new for everyone you know and uh, it's easy for me to we made fun of like if someone is making fun of me you know uh even if there is malice now now earlier i could not take malice but now i'm okay with malice also you yeah. know but i felt that a people are could be slightly uncomfortable you know yeah. uh, being made fun of so in that sense that you know but then as we worked for months together we got to know each other better you know and they also know that this guy uh, has no malice you know when he's when he's making uh, fun of anybody you know right um 
so uh, it was it was it was terrific of them you know it was they, you know they were a good sport and chetan also you know when initially i had to explain to him that you know we are not coming from a bad space right you know uh, and most people who know me okay they just know that uh, most of this this, this humor is good natured humor and and it and it exists for a particular thing and i i told chetan and chetan has emerged chetan and netflix uh, have emerged so well in the series you know mm. because they're good sports right and i plan to do more of this if there is uh, you know if there are more seasons yeah i would love to watch it because uh, the end had me i mean it's it's a great ending um talking about chetan and uh, just uh, your own cameo i couldn't help but make the parallel to quentin tarantino in a couple of uh, his own movies uh, you know then robert rodriguez initially when i when i first saw agni um i had a i had a confusion i thought that was you but then i'd seen your face a bunch of times and then you emerge in another scene in the airplane um it's always weird to see the creator of the series um in the series itself because they i mean unless it's a unless they're the central character they usually o- occupy like a a very non actory 2 second 3 second role to say something witty or just you know like stanley's in in lots of marvel movies um what are you given props or like directions to act or be a certain way or were you would were you just playing yourself yeah See, it's interesting that it's very uh, intriguing that you mentioned Agni. You know, hmm. um, so I'll tell you something which I've not told anybody. I mean, nobody outside the the team knows. So I auditioned for Agni, okay, because I felt that uh, not many people will be able to pull off Agni. See, Agni. I mean, people find Arya politically incorrect and. and but he's still your hero so there are still boundaries he won't cross i right. still wanted one guy who has no boundaries okay who who would still be accepted has to be accepted because you have no choice because you have no argument against him see the thing with Ar- arya is also an argument you can't argue against like if you have an argument against arya then then uh, arya is defeated arya arya has no right to exist in the couple right so i need, but but still arya will not do a few things okay and agni was supposed to be that guy hmm. who pushes the boundaries i mean where you hope you hope there are boundaries you know even the greatest fan of sir i wanted to say boss no stop okay so i thought uh, uh i mean if i if if i'm writing it i should have the courage to do it like if that is the that is how far i want to go you know and within the framework of indian comedy huh? it's yeah. not that you can do anything in this country it's not that we are protected legally and you know? so that was the challenge for me right because hmm. i felt that okay i can say this i can say this then uh, i auditioned and uh, uh, most of the casting hardik and i took together like hardik was the person behind the casting is one of his strengths you know whatever right. you see you know uh, uh, uh is 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 like all the all the, all the other characters except for madhavan's character everybody else is you know uh, it was hardik's um, initiative you know and then he would show them to me and we'll have a discussion you know and then but in obviously in, in my audition hardik could be the only person to decide and uh, he thought you know atul was a person who fit the role better hmm. you know than me and uh, when i see myself in the series I felt that okay, maybe as an actor, I mean, I'm not, uh, you know, I'm not up there, you know, for some reason. But I feel that it's one of the things I can do if I want to, yeah. you know, if I kind of prepare, you know. It was a nothing role, so it was okay. But it was like I find uh, like all the director. I don't know a single director who's a bad actor, you know. Hmm. They're all reasonably good actors. Like Tarantino, as you mentioned, he's very good, you know, even in the scenes that he appears. So I feel that it is something which which I can do once I make a decision that. Uh, uh i you know every time i think of uh not being myself which is what acting is you know uh i uh, i feel that it is a blow i take as a novelist hmm. for some reason you know not even as a journalist you know uh because i've always said or been what uh i wanted to say you know so to become a fictitious character for some reason i feel that as a novelist can i do it you know so it's a very stupid question at one level but i'm unable to take that question out of my head 
Hmm. So these are irritating things about being a novelist. You know, that's that's what I meant by you know it's too serious. You know, and I'm enjoying this phase last four five years when I've not written a novel. Right? It is kind of it's it's been very enjoyable. Yeah. 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 I I remember you did a interview with the Hindu a while ago or maybe a year ago, where you uh, referenced David Foster Wallace talking about John Updike. Hmm. and how that bastard has had no unpublished son of a bitch. yeah that son of, son of a bitch has had no unpublished thought and then you mentioned how between your journalism and uh, you know novels and now this you are always able to express yourself fully yes. and i think what was wonderful about arya is he does not give a fuck he will stand up in the face of humiliation and um, ridicule yes and and still say the unpleasant sin yes. thing still say the thing that that everyone has on their in their minds but is too afraid to say because everyone is out there pretending to be nice and suave and elite gurgaon and what not and will face ridicule and then still wake up the next morning and do the same bloody thing yes. again i love that about him where he does not give a fuck about ki you know maybe it's someone's funeral or someone's marriage or or even a art gallery show he will say the thing what no one else is willing to say it's like a disease in his head that if he can't get it out something wrong with him was that i know that you you, you said uh, somewhere I'm, else i won't use the word disease because yeah. i i find i find disease very interesting that's why i said that as hmm. a word we have to be very careful with the word disease because that is a very very interesting word but yeah everything else i agree yeah so. yeah the, the the i know that you mentioned elsewhere that this is not autobiographical but i couldn't help but make a parallel is this some is this something that you yourself act out in your real life or is this just a character you built on on the pages of your notebook or your uh, laptop uh, it's like this you know some some people are just shy like i i am i'm actually people would find it strange when i say it. i'm just a shy person in the sense that i know what to do in a situation which would be true to myself yeah. you know but i don't like being conspicuous you know hmm. where uh, uh because then it's all or nothing for me you know so then if it is you know so most of the time i feel that i can just i'm i'm someone who just does not want to be noticed in a situation you know and but as you said these are thoughts which everybody has and there are people who are not so shy you know because for them the need to react is greater you know so in that sense arya is not me at all okay i just i'm just someone who knows the theory you know hmm. recently one of the people who enjoyed the couple asked me a similar question and i was like wondering and i don't know i'm just wondering if one aspect of writing is also acting you know right so maybe i am acting okay through but through my writing Hmm. uh in in the couple right because because acting is not a complete recreation like in a conventional acting madhavan is not completely recreating him you know himself there is a lot of madhavan in arya okay people don't notice this is he's a far more politically incorrect person than me you know he, he there is a lot you know in fact i was very worried hmm what if madhavan you know turns out to be a politically correct because even i thought he's a good boy you know uh, so his guy he has this good boy image and i loved the idea of a good boy image guy playing arya because everybody immediately like him he's, a, he's got a likable face and yes. likable persona you know and i thought okay uh, i need to carefully talk to him and figure out if he's going to say but you know manu isn't that a bit kind of but he turned out to be the opposite like for example in the in in episode 1 hmm. uh there is a scene where like he doesn't want to shake the hands of teenagers because he finds them not very hygienic uh so he's just supposed to refuse the hand that's all but what whatever happened after i don't want to give away the you know whatever, whatever happened after that right it's madhavan's improvisation you know so you know uh, so so he you know he has that uh, that playfulness in him you know and like most with, with most good natured people you know who don't mean anything you know who don't have an agenda you know he kind mm. of gets away with it right so uh, so yeah yeah he does i i watched his interview there's this uh, channel on youtube called mashable india they have a bunch of car where this host sits down and they they drive the 
guest from the house, their house to wherever they want to go, their workplace. And on the way, they have a chat. And so the host asked Madhavan is Mumbai memories. And he flat out said, I used to make out with my wife here, 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 here. And we couldn't do that. And I was like, that's crazy. I've never seen, you know, I've seen Madhavan always play the nice guy, always be polite. Like, oh, this, this respectable guy from South India that everyone loves. And then he's out there saying, I, I, this is my <laughs> young, young, young life escapades. Yeah. Um, but how involved were you on the set of The Couple? Uh, how much of your own were you like giving? Because I saw a bunch of pictures of you and Madhavan and Surveen and Hardik together. Uh, were you giving instructions to Madhavan and Surveen and other actors to do things in a certain way? Or were you just kind of sitting back in an observer's room? No, no. I, 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 on the floor, I gave no instructions. You know, the director was the the person who led the floor, you know. Hmm. He was the one who briefed the actors, and uh, I was I was on the set all day, every day of the shoot, except for three days. You know when I actually had to rewrite some of the endings or you know whatever you know. Mm. So, uh, but for those three days, I was on the sets uh, throughout. Uh, so I was I mean I would be there and I would have a lot of suggestions, and we had a lot of discussions. You know. Uh, naturally, you know, but yeah. uh, nothing beyond. I see. Um, many uh, books, I mean, books certainly can, but many series in the last so many years haven't really touched the touchy so uh, topic of uh, India's class divide, how we um, behave with our drivers, our maids. I mean, Aravind Adhika did it first in his uh, book, The White Tiger in 2008, which was a long time ago. Um, and then we saw it in the, in the series. Or here we have a. I I sent it to you in the show notes. There, there's a there's a there's a scene where uh, Madhuvan sees a new maid auditioning, you know, being hired for the role of you know cleaning their house, and Surveen Chavla uh, sees that you know she's uh, kind of attractive, and he and he points it out. And then then there's a whole line about how um, uh, Gurgaon Mame Sahibs won't hire the maid if she's pretty. That's why all the maids in Gurgaon have inner beauty. I I, I cracked up. I was on the airplane, um, and everyone was sleeping. But it was because it, it, no one is willing to talk about this. Uh, you know, it's it's always um, done and dusted and and shooed away in the dark corners of our psyches. Even in film and books, this doesn't really come up as much. But you were out there just saying, "Look, this is what happens. This is this is how the classes interact." Um, did you get pushed back for that at all? What What was the Not at all? Um, so, but this particular example hmm. that you cite is different from the class conflict in decouple. See, decouple hmm. is uh, about human behavior. You know the way I look at it; it's about behavior. Okay, everything I do is about behavior. You know, right. and decouple definitely is about behavior, and uh, it is about it is a biography of a marriage. You know, certainly. A phase of a marriage. Hmm. And the third important thing, and I'm very glad that a lot of viewers have not directly, uh, they, they, they feel it, okay, but it doesn't strike them, okay. Hmm. But the third important layer in the couple is class conflict because that is, uh, uh, that to me is everything. I think every everything, uh, all of politics, everything emerges from class conflict, you know. Hmm. Uh and I, I, it is you can't you can't do a comedy in India, you know, which, and to me, comedy is almost on the level of anthropology, you know. And right. If it is not, then it is kind of lame. Uh, you can't avoid class. And and if I want to portray a particular society, we are serviced by these people, you know. We have a driver; he's supposed to come, and then see some of the best people with who say lovely things in India in the op-ed and all this uh, political economists and uh, those beautiful people, you know. It might look like I'm making fun of them, but I'm mm. just telling you that their drivers have 12-hour days. There is no, no not as I challenge you, that no driver in Gurgaon can have eight hours because it doesn't make sense, okay? Mm. Because, because eight hours is the day of the Sahib. Okay, so how can the drivers debate? Okay, it can't because then the guys also have to go somewhere, come, and then the driver has to emerge from home. Okay, by European standards, we calculate like, what time did he leave home for huh. work? It gets all you know. So that's why I don't like middle class morale. I, I have no problems with that. I'm I'm telling you, I'm not a better person. Okay, I'm not here to. I'm just saying that 
why uh, i'm just saying that it is very difficult for the indian upper middle class to even pretend to be good people okay <laughs> because we need we need a few things and those things are available to us because we are a poor country okay right see what happens in a poor country again i'm not making any moral judgment because to me that's very boring you know that is exactly the kind of imbeciles that i have to deal with who react to my pieces you know so i don't want to go in in that direction but what is interesting about a poor country is that it is inexpensive to be rich right and a lot of things emerge from that if you look at europe and most of the problems that they are going through america it's very expensive to be rich and now india now some of the problems that that the intellectuals uh, are having stop you there. I'm, i'm not sure i understand what do you mean it is inexpensive to be rich in it's india it's really easy to be rich is that what you're saying yeah it doesn't cost much money like compared hmm. to like see the guy who would tweet in india that auto guys are ripping him off okay 100 bucks i want to ask when he goes to tokyo for airport hmm. and you have to go to the hotel and okay you are taking what is the cap for it's 2000 bucks 3000 bucks yeah. okay london airport heathrow to central london is 2000 rupees yeah. if you're taking a cab okay and this guy is asking for 100 bucks and yes of course he's ripping off of course he's ripping off because he's supposed to charge only 20 bucks right but what is 20 bucks you know like how can he survive on 20 bucks that's not a question we we would ask right, right. so i'm saying that we get good quality of life we get a maid for uh 8000 rupees mm mm-hmm. and all this people including the male and female feminists they pay the driver more okay mm-hmm. though he does far less than right. the maid because that's a market rate that's that's the nature of market okay i'm not questioning anything drivers 12 hour day 12000 now it is maybe 15 16000 bucks in yeah. gurgaon i mean what is this okay these are if you want a driver in new york Fifty thousand bucks, okay, and it's more than the purchasing power parity. You you multiply Indian expenses in by four, you get the purchasing power parity. But even even then, it would be more expensive. Right. Okay. So that's what I mean by it is very cheap to be rich in India, mm-hmm. but at the same time, it is becoming a bit expensive to be upper middle class in India. Okay, mm-hmm. I'll explain that also, which is the problem with most of the intellectuals having. I mean, if a college professor. economist type you know you had reasonably good life earlier but now with the new money some industrialist in small town right he has up the prices of say taj in most cities okay you won't feel it now because of the pandemic there all otherwise just before the pandemic i'm telling you a lot of people who could afford five star hotels in india they could not afford it anymore okay I mean now now with the rates because you would not get a Taj room for less than 25 grand okay before the pandemic you know in most of the places so it was getting very expensive to be the upper middle class right so i i'm saying that uh, uh though that was a di- digression so the so uh, the class conflict in decoupled emerges from the fact that we need these people and we use them hmm. and uh, they are not uh, they are not treated even as well as they are treated in singapore so if you look at uh, some of my friends in singapore were telling me the law f- for maids and other uh, other house help in singapore and that's a far more humane society hmm. than india okay which claims to be a complete democracy you know so Yeah, uh one one thing that emerges from this uh discussion about maids and drivers and class is Sureen uh mentions in in the series that um sorry it it's Madhavan who who tells her um that I I think he he makes a parallel around um how she's she would hate to be a woman who likes discussing maids because all the other society women do that and I mean I couldn't help but laugh because I have seen this throughout um my own family and and other people whose families I visit where there's a fetish that the rich ha- rich have when they run out of things to talk about they talk about their maids and their drivers and it's usually the matriarchs who have the least responsibility in the family who are most nosy <laughs> about what the maid is doing about what the driver is doing to the point where they literally drive them out and the reason it was funny to me is because i'd seen this 
I knew I'd even written some notes about it, but I'd never seen it act actually being acted out on a, on a massive series like hmm. you know Netflix and yours, Decoupled. Um, is that something that you just gleaned over, for, like observed from living in and around Gorgon? Yes, yes, yeah? I know. I I know women who who hate the fact that other women around them hmm. just keep talking about maids, you know, maids and children. Yeah, and uh, you know those kind of topics that um, people are trapped in, you know, because of the gender or or various other reasons, you know, the conversation well, roles. Um, yeah, because of the roles hmm. that you know. Uh, so uh, I'm glad that these, you know, these moments are what decoupled is about, right? Because and it is just a night, not an arc. It is just something that he says. Yes. Right. And uh, I'm so glad that people are noticing it, you know, and, and people like you are noticing it, and you remember it. You know, it is not nothing is a bridge, in the couple. Nothing is meant for a bigger thing. Hmm. You know, everything is big. You know, it is not just the story. You know, and uh, it's not filler content to drive the plot forward, yes. to drive the story forward. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Exactly. You know. Uh, and uh, and the second observation that he makes is so it's basically the conversation where she says you know what is that one thing that I hate the most she's about to launch and you know then he says uh, 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 other women talking to you about maids then she says okay what well, what's what's the second most thing and then he tells and that to me you know it could be its own episode later you know yeah. uh, doctors not believing women when they complain of allergies. it is one of the most underreported thing in india you know when when a doctor meets a woman and he listens to her the real asshole in the indian society is actually the male doctor okay who's not been investigated enough because he does not believe 90% of the things a woman patient lady patient is telling him okay yeah uh, and even if it's psychosomatic i'm saying that it is still real in that person who's telling you right okay that i have this pain i have these things so they just were you know they just use uh they just use words like fibromyalgia which was actually i i, I was quite fascinated when i saw a i saw a serial where a doctor mentions fibromyalgia as a way of making fun of women you know um so i mean so that is that is that is a passing comment from arya right but people notice yeah. these things because they have they know it happens in their lives yeah right talking about observations further um the bit about how arya is standing in the locker room speaking on the phone um naked which is the norm uh across um which is the norm in many western countries um i'm going to tell you a little story about that um i went to my i went to claridge's suraj kund with my father at when i was i believe 12 or 13 when is the sauna uh, obviously my father was not going to expose himself to me because that would be a bit weird but i saw a lot of old men with dicks and i was um, surprised for the lack of a better word and then when i went to college at boston we used to sneak inside the faculty locker locker room because it had the sauna lo and behold again all kinds of dicks you know like uh, long shrivel dicks and i wasn't so surprised anymore but it just I couldn't help but think about some of the other gym khanas that I've been to where uh every man I see has this thing where they'll have the wet uh um, boxers or underwear and they'll wear a towel around and they'll take it out slightly from 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 the inside and then uh what I'm basically trying to say is they always have underwears on inside the male locker room in india in always and and to the point where i even know some people who privately in their own showers still shower with the underwear on and it's a very weird phenomenon there's just something about may, maybe we don't have a locker room culture in the country where you know like as athletes as male athletes you go in like you you know just are completely naked which is why there's such a shyness around it so um the act of Arya standing in a locker room talking um on the phone uh scares these kids and they take videos and the women are like my god like you should not do that now is is that something again that yeah yeah, yeah. it is like i i i've noticed there are two kinds of men in uh, i was a member of the golf club hmm. you know, in, um in gurgaon and also koram 
And I noticed that uh, though this this trend emerges from my compassion, by the mm. way, uh, there are two kinds of men: men who are uh, who are shy, you know, mm. and they would be in that underwear or shorts, and men who uh, strut around naked, mm. right? So I do understand the walking bit in the sense that if you need to be naked. Like I saw it in Amsterdam also. They are more aggressive. Hmm. They they walk around naked throat. And I I'll always know where he goes. There's no reason to walk. Okay. Hmm. He, I mean, he didn't fetch anything. I would notice that right. he didn't have reason to. But he wants to walk around. And there's something about being naked in public for yeah. most men where it's a sense of liberation that uh, they kind of walk uh, a bit, which I used to find very funny because... <laughs> There's nothing that you're achieving by the walk because right. you're just pretending to. But when you're stationary and you're naked because you need to change, I have great compassion for that uh, need for men to uh, be com- be completely naked right. when you're changing clothes because this because towels have become very thick nowadays. You know, in, in expensive. Uh, yeah. clubs there used to be uh, very thin cloth exactly yeah. you know the thin cloth okay can be whipped out okay mm. like all our fathers have done with the lungi and yeah. you uh but with the thickening towel and there's some kind of a de- indian decorum that these guys have to maintain after it's extremely difficult to change uh your clothes you know while wearing a very thick towel right. know, so i thought this is something which arya should take see some of the things on some of the things in uh, decoupled are, uh, are campaigns that I want to continue with change you know right. like in an airport like why is the security guy standing at the airport okay and uh, uh, so there are three queues now okay yeah. for indians or no other country in the world you know has your soldier standing outside checking your air ticket you know yeah. my, my my sympathies are with the soldier too because hmm. you know I mean, not a soldier. In fact, that's what he takes on. He's part of the, you know, uh, part of technically part of the police force. But anyway, right. uh, why? How does he know this is a ticket? Why does he? Why does he want to check? It's like, what do you think you're up to? Okay, why did you come to the airport? And if it is, if it is to discourage people who are not passengers, but you know how Indians are so jobless. If one person is going, eight people will go with, just to say bye. you can introduce platform tickets okay yeah, like, like you do in the railways. railways yes okay that's worked very well one fine of 50 bucks that's enough to scare indians okay 50 bucks over love right uh and if someone if you want to discourage people from leaving a bomb in the airport well boss he would book a ticket for that okay yeah. he's not going to you know not place the bomb because there'll be a security guy checking a ticket he can very well make a fake it's yeah. a completely irrational thing which indians like thousands and thousands of in every day we accept without questioning challenging you know instead of you know i that's why we have stamina for useless things yeah you know, we fight over useless things but this something which is wasted say roughly 50 hours of our adult life we don't say why why do you need it why, you know so if the couple can change that you know mm. i want i want to reach out to the aviation minister i want to reach out to the not not the aviation minister but i, I want to change that right so let's see if yeah talking about social change let's also discuss security guards outside five star hotels checking cars yeah you know because i've been there i've tried to do what i mean in the couple area goes way too far just to see if the if you know it's like a there's there's a there's a show called black mirror one of the episodes um the there's a there's a kidnapper killer and he plays like a massive joke on the world and he wants to see if they will uh, if they will agree or not he has the he forces the prime minister to have sex with a pig live um and and then he will free um i think the i think the princess of england something like that hmm. um but he just wants to play at the world and and uh, eventually the prime minister does have to have sex uh with the pig and and the guy kills himself because he because he because he feels like wow i was anyhow the the, the point is it's just funny to see arya take that joke so far where 
the security are and this is what they do they have this mirror where they check the front of the car in case there's a bomb fitted there the back in case you have someone kidnapped or a potential i don't know like narcotics or some other thing and but at times i can't open the car bonnet because i can't find the thing and they're like we insist on this and then i'm like can we just go and and because there's a protocol that isn't questioned by anyone time is wasted yeah. so it's it's so funny that i mean it, and, and the whole moment in the i could have a gun in my sock i could yeah. i could be laden with bombs right. inside the car right but he doesn't want to know right yeah it's it's not exhaustive it's not an exhaustive check it's a very weird perfunctory on the outside check that makes no sense and what's funny is that that whole moment in the series is given uh, like one or two minutes of screen time and and that's it never mentioned again never so it's just weird that how arya is always making sure that his his anti hypothesis of what the world looks like and feels like is being shown in the series which i thought was very cool after a while because it, it starts off with the the first thing he says is um it, it, the first scene about book clubs and 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 uh about teenage boys there's there's an entire series of observations that he must make um and it just keeps on going are there any particular observations that you are delight um you know putting on screen or are there any observations that maybe people retweet it at you like i really love this bit no uh i don't have favorites but mm. i like uh, i always like i like it when there is complexity in the visual medium like mm. what i mean by that is that people tend to think uh, i mean uh, most of visual uh, medium is very simple compared to the written medium I mean, you take right tv journalism is very simple there are very simple people saying simple things most of the time mm. and a guy who tries to be complex he gets crude in some way you know i'm not mm. there's something about the visual medium where people f- also feel it has to be simple straight you can't do too many too read many. off a teleprompter just uh, just uh, no even a complex thing like for example uh, uh oh, or that is a theory that you can't say complex things hmm. so i like but i don't agree with that okay i feel that if you work a bit hard I, there is something to that view that uh, compared to a novel or a or a written word okay complexity uh, the visual medium is not a good medium for com- complex thoughts hmm. but there is a way of doing it okay and if one way of doing it is just prepare people for it okay Pre- creatively prepare for failure because you feel that this is important like that's why i loved birdman the film mm. now in birdman there is uh, i think it is just a passing uh, sticker on the a note on the wall okay a thing is a thing not what is said about the thing okay so to me that is a uh, complex moment which people immediately get in the context of but you know but because they've already prepared you for complexity right right and i feel that it is under uh, under utilized in the visual medium because most people are not readers you know mm. i feel that you know as a writer and a reader okay i i feel that readers make a big issue about reading they made it into a one kind of a skill or ability but most people in this world are not readers they're very intelligent hmm. okay they're very smart people and they just have not developed the skill to read yeah okay but as a result i feel that they're missing out on a, a particular kind of fun which is available to readers okay which they don't realize okay they don't realize because the people in the visual medium have a certain idea of complexity and simplicity which is not true anymore okay uh even something as simple as how the resolution of cameras today okay hmm. and how much people are used to reading text itself can give you a new insight into how much complexity you can insert okay hmm. maybe f- 30 years ago people were not good at reading text on screen okay maybe the cameras are not good enough to focus that sharply on the back or people were not used to reading text so easily now people read subtitles they read whatsapp they read everything so maybe you can quickly put in a few things which things which don't look good in dialogue okay imagine right. a guy in birdman saying a, a thing is a thing not what is said about the thing that's cheesy because that looks like a great line coming mm. out of a character unless he's a writer or he's speaking it doesn't work in a dialogue okay 
see that's why arya spinma indie couple is still a writer he has still lines there's still ideas which a line embodies okay in a very very efficient way that's why arya talks into the uh phone to yeah, record the, his phone speech you know? text those yeah. house speech because there are lines which don't work in a dialogue you know that because that's not how speak people talk yeah when people are imperfect especially indians yeah. they speak in a very imperfect way right um so i so the element of complexity you know i was talk- I, i i brought all this in to say that i like moments of complexity you know a complex thing is not a complicated thing you know a complex thing is merely something which is like you just think you have understood one layer then you say oh shit there's this yeah, this, this. Yeah. you know and people are getting it you know uh because it's only a particular kind of people who are getting uh, decoupled right so yeah. the 5% 10% who are not getting it or hate it for various other reasons you know they hate it probably because it's too real for them they went through the same thing in their marriage or yeah. maybe they have a big bum and they took it took up a particular scene very personally you know uh or for whatever reasons you know or maybe they yeah. just you know but for 95% of the people uh i always like it when when uh, when my theory that people have a huge capacity for complexity comes true yeah what's also incredible about the the scene at the airport is you would expect that after arya's um, spat with with the with the soldier uh he would just be put on the no fly list and and stuff would happen and then they would cut out a snippet of that post it on twitter as in i'm talking about actual real life and say manu joseph and netflix and international it's so funny that 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 is already referenced like a possible reaction to that sort of scene is has anybody referenced. done that sorry has anybody done that uh what do you mean that i'm i'm and no I, i don't think so huh. I don't, but that's what i'm saying huh. because possible uh, reactions to what what that can be are already mentioned are already covered in the series so that sort of you know like like you can't really do anything now yeah you 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 mentioned the obvious elephant in the room yeah which i thought was great yeah yeah oh uh, so we uh, so, so most of these things seem to be in, in, in fact we could we could do some of these things uh partly because of my journalistic training in the sense that uh I have a sense of what you can get away with in India at a particular time okay mm. for the next okay. 10 years everything it changes every 5 years mean? see uh there are no rules and laws I you know we are protected by very broad laws and uh, and most of the time when people invest so much resources in a project like you know we are a paradise for people who want to create trouble right because we're very secular that we all courts can create but there are some things which you can do and get away with okay as long as people know see that is the problem that is why i dislike activism and politics and writing okay that is why i, I because they've ruined my professions okay i have my uh, journalism and fiction okay they've ruined it by polluting it with agenda because then they then they know that you have an agenda okay mm. then why should they because why should they tolerate you because when you are claiming to create art for a for your agenda and then they will they will hit back at the in their way so this the defense of comedians and writers and filmmakers that you let us do you also do your films is not a great argument because that guy who's a nationalist he has no platform to be a comedian or to make a film or to write right it's easier for him to go to court and file one F, one pil after the other or go to the police station where his uncle is the thing and file an fir okay so he is going to respond in his way right mm. and so I, that's why i feel that uh, uh, one if it's a good natured humor indians get it mm. and if it's a, if it has no agenda you know uh, then they they kind of they you know they see we are very funny you know in fact i find uh, we are the second funniest people and f- funniest people in the world are pakistanis yeah okay Was the sec- second funniest are actually indians okay uh, 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 on an average you take a guy on the street okay that yeah. uh, that philosophical thug that that comic guy you know we we are that you know right 
so they get it you know but if you but if you kind of polluted with your uh, your agenda okay because we are also very political hmm. okay we have our own problems right so i feel that there are things i mean I, we are not a free country at all okay but a certain tension emerges from that okay and if you play it well okay uh, you can really there's nothing funnier than seeing something funny in a tight ass country <laughs> right uh so uh, so the, so so you know so I, i i i'm not i'm not a naive person i i won't do a few things which which are trouble for people who backed me okay i i uh i i feel that i have a responsibility for people towards people who backed me also right? right that i don't want you know anybody to get into trouble or you know so well, yeah so uh, so this anti national thing okay was a moment from it's a very indian moment okay yeah. that, that you know you kind of question a guy but then arya's heart is clear because he was actually on the side of the the guy say, right? as a yeah. guy because he was saying that you know your time can be better utilized you know yeah yeah um i'm i'm just wondering when uh, when you were making that scene there's a there's a trope about uh the the bar with the twitter retweets filling up and then that happens again and again and again and it's funny that because arya is a writer twitter still happens to be the medium that he gets viral on this is the medium where all the fights happen right it's not instagram not tiktok not youtube it's that and then how his twitter account um kind of plays a central role in the events in his life where he has to either um be for them against them uh defend them now i know you're very active on twitter and um you've been responding to a lot of reviews negative and positive alike um is this like the platform that you inhabit the most and that yeah. that's why you got the idea to also have twitter arya being active on twitter no i i should say, i'm not actually very active on twitter it would appear but now because of decoupled i've been tweeting five times a day otherwise it's usually around my article or when i have to defend myself right but uh, in fact i got onto twitter very late you know i thought it would be something i don't need mm, but uh, i just find a, a social media on the whole you know uh, a very useful device in storytelling you know hmm. now that it's become so common right and twitter uh gets viral faster you know it's just one of those things that i would like to use so i have no particular reason to use twitter in fact i feel most writers are actually not on it twitter has its own new uh celebrities you there's know a new kind of internet writer emerging on twitter there's a lot of people who write threads uh but it's huh. all very it's all very um, huh. basic tech tech centric web3 elon musk uh, jacking off that kind of thing so chetan bhagat and amish are the only authors who have who kind of have a big following on twitter right, right? um uh but otherwise it's kind of most writers have not you know or they entered twitter too late or they didn't grasp the the spirit of the medium fast enough hmm. you know because um so uh, but yeah by plan to use uh, so what i like about this medium is it's not a it's not a trope that people it's a trope but it is not a trope people say you use too many times it's like what tv news was at one point when you want to quickly convey something right that if tv news a news reader will say something or you know, some so i plan to use this uh, because it's the reality of our life right okay anything that public figures do you know they go viral they are on social media all the time so i'm not going to say oh i used it once there should i i have no problems and i would you know uh, i i think that it's very convenient yeah hmm. um i was not i had not read your writing um hmm. uh, a lot i we had serious men at our house my father is a big reader and that's how i got into reading it uh, but but i i saw a lot of your articles snippets um on instagram those 1080 by 1080 squares that you put up hmm. um and that's very nice because i see a lot of my you friends you know the measurement it. also yes <laughs> yes i mean it's just case in point cuz cuz we use all these mediums to even you know broadcast the podcast but no i don't measure and i'm oh. so i'm very kind of fascinated that you think and it's just yeah. that i kind of whatever oh yeah it's, it's, i edit it in such a way on the on iphone okay that oh, you do I, so i don't know the measure yeah i just do it manually i didn't know there was measure so so does it happen sometimes it, it just becomes too big for you it does thing? okay yeah. then i have to delete it and go i don't know that you, you could actually do a proper measure and then you can know oh, yeah i mean you 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 can't really but phones have this option where i mean some phones do where you can do a, so it's called one is to one hmm. 
the usual uh, temp like a phone screen is nine nine is to sixteen, and if you do landscape, that sixteen is to nine, and then one is to one is the ratio. I don't know how they divide it up, but that's the the most that's the ratio that Instagram uses, and now it's become like like pretty much universal except for Twitter which has like so a it's basically ratio. a square I have it's a to square. just focus it's a I square. just have to make it a square you just have to make okay. it a square and then once once you make it a square um, it will show on this it will be a post just like what you see on the screen but if you make it anything else it's gonna zoom in zoom yeah, out mess yeah. it up all of that yeah but, but those squares are great because you have excerpts from yes. your longer pieces on Mint yeah. and then we can read them and they're, they're usually observations um, I see that um, on Instagram Writing is tricky because you use anything too complex and it stops being shareable. You use um, a small font and people won't read it. Um, it, it. It comes down to stopping your scroll, arresting your attention, having you react to it and then... You know, and it's ugly. And it's Generally, ugly. it's very ugly compared yeah. to what people are used to. Yeah. Yeah. But like, has that worked where, I mean, do people, have you found an audience through those Instagram? Because I don't know if you have a lot of followers on Instagram. It's mostly Twitter. Um, but but um, I certainly enjoy reading those uh, and I've tagged you a bunch of times as well. Um, have you, has there been like a different kind of audience coming to your writing from Instagram than say your usual readers on Mint? No. No? I'm, so it's the usual readers who are reminded of a piece. Now, after my column went paid, Mint has put it under the premium oh. column, so it's only for paid subscribers. Right. Um, I, I I feel that probably I've lost most of the former readers, hmm. you know. Um, so, but I, I have to keep nudging, you know, because Mint, uh, Mint pays me very well and I have no moral reason to persuade them to make me free. You know, I have right. absolutely no moral reason. So it's a, it's a good strategy, and uh, the uh, uh, so uh, so. But the only thing I can keep nudging people to know, okay. Uh, oh, I also feel now that an article need not be only a piece by me need not be only thousand words or hundred thousand words or a screenplay. It can also be two lines. Yes, you know. So that's the way I am looking at. Uh, at the Instagram post, you know, which has hmm. its own, uh, I mean, it's still old readers, hmm. but uh, but they always respond and they kind of engage uh, with it more than on Facebook, you hmm. know. Facebook has changed something in the algorithm to avoid people like me because yeah. I think they want to make it more personal and about uh, friends, you know, and not yeah, no, about journalism it, or anything. It you know? stopped being about friends a long time. Oh, Facebook. I don't know what it is about, yeah. but I'm not getting it. Earlier, I was, uh, I, I didn't choose... I, mean, I chose Facebook over Twitter, right? Really? I was not on Twitter, right? Uh, but then I realized that people are not engaging us. But then on Instagram, even yeah. though I don't have many followers, uh, people uh, engage uh, with these small pieces a lot. You know, mm. and they share it a lot, and and I don't think they're clicking on the uh, on the article link which I've given too much. Okay. Yeah. But this is enough for them, and I'm okay with that, you know, because yeah. this this is also a piece. But what irritates me is some guys will take it and put it on their post like their po it's their card. Yeah. And tell me also. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so it's a big compliment huh. that he has stolen my uh, line, okay? Yeah. And I find it a bit silly to put uh, uh, my name on that thing. Right. Right, on that card. So uh, this one one thing about people is that they uh, don't realize how irritating they are, <laughs> and, and most of the time they think they're being nice or they're giving you a call, but they're very irritating. Yeah, you know? they're irritating. Although they pass a comment, which is a nothing comment, you know. And uh, so I've started a new thing on Instagram where I just tell people, "Don't irritate me." Okay, <laughs> so people just enjoy that also. You know, the kind of just uh, kind of it's like an award for a yeah. particular kind of a thing. I don't use it lightly. A particular kind of a kind of a, kind of a you know irritating person. You know, I just. So what will they say? Will they say hi? On your, in your no, DMs? it is not that. Like hi, yeah. I don't have to respond. I I, I yeah. don't respond to most things. But he'll, he'll say, okay, so I've clearly this is clearly a snippet yeah. of an article. So it'll come up with an argument, which has already been taken up in the main article. Like yeah. this guy has not read the article, yeah. okay, or something like that, you know. So uh, there, you know, or some kind of a stupid point of view, you know. So then I would have to tell them, 
you know don't eat it see now earlier i would want to abuse them you know i would call them even now i kind of restrain i call them simpleton hmm. i don't use words like moron hmm. or you know any of the harsh words which is like first time you want to use uh because i've kind of i i feel that people are really really going through their own stuff you know yeah. i have a new uh restrain now because you have no idea who's the stranger even yeah. if it's a reviewer i don't know most of them i don't know what they're going through and uh, okay they they said something which irritates me but imagine a guy is going through some kind of thing and i also publicly call him a moron it's like i don't want to do that anymore yeah you, you don't know? want to shove him down further yeah, yeah yeah but i think sim- sometimes i think simpleton is yeah. fair enough because I, then i i also try to say something more okay where in a in the spirit of journalism that i'm also <laughs> making an argument okay apart from yeah. calling you a simpleton i've also made an argument so it's of yeah. value to everybody right yeah do you ever take off the journalist hat but why but that is a uh, it is uh, it's it's something that i am at all times in the sense that for example if if a hotel says okay we'll give you free accommodation just mm. tweet about us on insta like it's a fairly legit thing to do right. for others it's, it's very uh, uh, it's the norm now it's, it's called uh, for co- like a barter deal. collaboration yeah, yeah yeah you know and it's yeah. absolutely fine for all pro- I can't do it. I won't yeah. do it because that's what I mean by or if if I'm doing it, okay? Then I have to mention that I'm doing it because they give me a free room and then uh, so and I'm absolutely fine with anybody else doing it. Yeah. Okay, because it makes complete sense you're an influencer, you've you've done a great service to them by posting about their room and how great it is and all that kind right. of stuff. So, I mean, it's probably great. But I can't do it because I'm so I'm a journalist at all times. okay because when i say something okay and even if it is just 100 people okay who are reading me i want them to always know that it is whatever comes out of my mouth hmm. is something that i mean hmm. right that's why even when i said writing is acting like first time it struck me when someone asked me people have been asking me are you arya are you arya or actually is it something that you want to be hmm. so so when i say write writing is also a kind of acting I I mean to say in the context that even in acting there's a certain projection like that's what Madhavan could not have done Arya if he did not have that Arya in him right okay there is no way any guy who does not have Arya in him can do that role okay mm. it'll look quite bad you know <laughs> just trust me you know some goody goody guy you know one of those woke guys right doing it even if he's a good actor yeah. you know he won't be able to project that mm-hmm. thing because basically it's uh, he's an underdog somehow he makes himself the underdog in that situation yeah i i also almost you know when they use lol they don't really mean it they're not actually laughing out loud but actually lol when i saw arya refer to his wife's mental health counselor not really a therapist she's not even a clinical psychologist it's a bunch of bunch of bs you know how people can just do that um but he calls her and uh, and her friends uh, people in the trauma industry i thought was so hilarious because um i i have been to these circles i i know exactly what 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 this is where it's it's like a um, one up manship of of uh you know talking about who can speak about public tragedies the most and as and as much as possible you know like have you heard about the kids in somalia or the kids in sierra leone are almost dying or did you hear about that yada 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 and but their lives are so far removed i mean they, they they don't look like mother teresa's they don't they're not in rags themselves there's this this huge divide and uh, there's a kind of virtue signaling in in talking about uh, the poor and being around people who are traumatized you know like there's i think the i think social service is fetishized to the point where it's become fashionable right and i and, and so i love that whole trope of uh the two gay men and and the mental health counselor just talking about it as if this is all they talk about and yet again arya can't stop himself because he sees the obvious and like these guys are fools uh but i just wanted to say that i really hmm. enjoyed that so uh from arya's point of view they may not be fools but he is more interested than the people he's more interested in two two complexing which which you have felt which you hmm. 
is uh, I mean, these are things which you actually don't see in comedy because it's funny, okay, it's fun. But then the the reason why you laugh is that he is seeding some things in your mind. One one is that uh, these people like talking about trauma, okay, like, mm. uh, and uh, th- there was a uh, most of the time people who are not kind to their own family are the ones with great compassion for the world hmm. you know, and other things. So it is a form of compensation that people who are, who are uh, most of these, uh, most of the time people who need to behave like assholes to the people who matter most to them are the ones who over articulate compassion to the world in general. See, we all feel the pain, you know, we all feel the pain of the world. Okay. And, Sometimes we feel so much we don't want to talk about it, right? Know? And there are people who you know there are there's a particular kind of you know when I was growing up I realized there's a particular kind of he'll only talk about rape in a hmm. very compassionate way, right? He's only compassion. He has only compassion for rape only. Hmm. Okay, so obviously it is something which he enjoys talking. Okay, right. it is one of those repressed <laughs> you know uh, South Indian behavior. Okay, where hmm. they have to. Uh, 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 Put it in the medium of social science for them to, you know, to, uh, you know, exp- you know, kind of exp- experience it in their own way. Now, there's another complex element in that observation of Arya, which is the element of sadism. Okay, which is gets more interesting. See, now, are there sadists in this world? I think most people will say yes. I mean, there they should be, right? Sometimes I feel that if we have a word for something, maybe that idea exists. Uh, now, where where do you, where do you think sadists are? Okay, You're some dark room living with his mom, growing a beard alone. No, a sadist is going to be in that place where he's going to see human miseries the most. Mm. So, who are the people who spend the most time, okay, beside human miseries? Okay, they are saints and sadists. Okay, so maybe they are two different people. But my argument is, what if in some cases they are the same? Right, right. You know, so uh, so I feel that I mean, if someone has not watched the couple, they're going to get scared. Like, oh my God, this is going to be no. It's not okay. But he he in in calling it the trauma industry, and in 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 saying that, oh boss, you keep talking about this all the time, and just that look which you know Madhavan gives in the way he says, mm. that's all. Okay, we have covered this complex topic in ten seconds, fifteen seconds, right? Mm. So to me, those are the things which give me joy. Right. Indie couple. You know, look at the kind of stuff which we are discussing, okay? And will people even know that we are talking about a comedy series, right? right. Because these are things even news television they they don't talk about it, right? Mm. Another thing that people don't talk about is is um, sex. I often find that uh, series um, that often come on OTT platforms, um, in the name of empowerment and uh, representing new Indians and youths, they kind of look at sex in a very uh, outlandish you know bar bar se dekh lete hain aise okay let's make a series about live in relationships but then it's just like from the outside right and and if it's about sex or female sexuality or male sexuality they don't really delve in deep they don't talk about uh, how we talk about sex in our average, average everyday life they kind of make a trope of sex make some lame jokes and then just move on here um sex is discussed frequently in fact one of the funny things is that i didn't expect at all is 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 the intricacies of old people having sex you know that that i that i saw in the series and i was like and 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 problems like utis which is again super common but because it's unglamorous to talk about old people having sex and getting utis no one's having that discussion but it's just something that um we talk about in our daily lives and then you know just sleep and forget about it but i'm just like did you did you have a list of things that you wanted to like man i'm going to talk about this in no, the series no, no, and this no. in the series and that Not in the issues. series see that's the thing i never i for me the issue is very boring okay hmm. compared to ideas right. right so ideas ideas and character you know so these are the things. So now some people might be very good at issues, or they might be interested. I mean, I have no problems with that. So, or, so if at all, but the issues are collateral, you know, things, you know, which just come up. Right. Mm, so, uh, but I, I, otherwise, I mean, I find I find food and sex. 
I don't understand people who are very interested in writing about food and sex or if their whole visual form is about that, you know, because mm. I feel that the more powerful an experience is, mm. more doomed you are in trying to uh, express it in writing yeah. or in any other, or, or, or as fiction, okay? Yeah. Because you can't match the real thing. Yeah. So, I mean... I mean, sex is a vast thing, so you can do a lot of other things around sex which are very interesting. But sex itself, you know, uh, it's tough. It's tough to match, you know, mm. at least from a guy's point of view. Now, this is like what what gender studies people call male gaze, you know, from male gaze. It's like Because we are professionals at sex in the sense that I feel sometimes that people who don't know how to have sex talk a lot about it. Yeah. As one of the characters says, yes. in Decoupled, you know, the people who don't have inner peace, they are the ones who talk more about inner peace. Uh, so, so, so if you see any sex in Decoupled, I'm trying to arrive at something else or using the power of sex to, you know, to make some of the argument. You know? Yeah. Similarly, some people love writing about food and it is, a, you know, I can never do that because it is so difficult yeah. to write about an ex an experience which is overpowering, right? Hmm. Well, there's a Richard Linklater movie um, called Waking Life, hmm. um, where they use stop motion animation, and this this guy this character goes around <coughs> the world speaking with different people, and he's the only guy who is still able to dream. That's the context of the film. Everyone else has lost the ability to dream, hmm. um, and he has a con conversation with this woman, and he sh she's saying. Uh, it's about how we agree on the definition of words. When I say love and you say love, our definitions of that word are completely different. Yet we agree on this abstract cloud somewhere. Yes. That means love, yeah. right? And like similarly, when people you know write about psychedelics or or you know sex or even food, the difficulty is: do we even know what we mean yeah. uh, when when we when we say that? And people often talk about psych psychedelics as divine and eye opening and you know like oh, fractals and visuals all all the byproducts of the experience but but the lived experience can't really be articulated yeah um and 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 that's that always remains a challenge so um were there any difficulties that you faced when you were trying to write some of the scenes in the series or maybe um like were there diffi difficulties you faced in trying to articulate some of these these things yeah, my chief difficulty with the screenplay is with the length of dialogues. Now, I can't say anything the character can't see or say. Hmm. Okay. And as a novelist, most of the things that you say are things you can't see uh, or nobody's even saying it. Okay, right. I'm just saying it. So my problem was with the length of the dialogue. Like how much can you say and you're not, uh, you know, so uh, and how... And because I like complexity, which should not be complicated or, you know, clumsy hmm. uh, or preachy, you know. Uh, so those are the ideas, like what would this character say at this point, okay. Um, so, uh, so, yeah, so with Arya speaking to the voice recorder, I could get some things, okay. But many complex, there are many complex things his wife, Shruti, you know, also has you know uh, she, she needs to see it like for example there is uh, and 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 uh, i feel that in retrospect the way people have reacted to the converse we would also show about conversations of this couple okay we have yes. a lot of conversations and then there was a nervousness around oh is it funny is it funny but now people are accepted that you don't have to be funny all the time right yeah there could be arguments between these two people you know uh like for example there is a line where you know like typical a typical male, like Arya is like this. First of all, they give you a small table. Hmm. On top of that, they keep put big flowers, okay, because everybody wants to look good. And from a guy's point of view, where am I going to keep my plate? I want one more, you know. Right. And uh, the women like the flowers in that, and he yeah. kind of he says, you know, why women like flowers? Because flowers are vagina. Yeah. And that's why you like it. And then they, in the original draft, there is a whole argument around it, where. She says, then you should like it, no? But then he says, we're full of ourselves, which is not there in the thing. We're yeah. full of ourselves. We like our own stuff. So we build the skyscrapers and the pillars. And you you want flowers on your table, you know, where even though there is no... Yeah. You know? So then, uh, I, then I, at that point, like in the 
if if there is a season two, I would not have a problem with this length because I know that now the arguments between these two is like magic. Yeah. Okay. But at that point, I would knock off these things. Okay, between them saying, you know, it's too long. This, this, this idea cannot be too long. Okay, it should be over in twenty seconds. This should mm. be over in thirty seconds. So I was uh, uh, inexperienced in, mm. in the sense that the reaction of the people, they have already made the series so rich because this kind of because I now I've got like literally thousands of reactions. Okay, I'm following mm. all of them. Okay, yeah. because because what they're saying and how they're reacting. So and now I'm more confident that these arguments between these couples are, are have a lot of substance because you know people because as long as it's the truth, hmm. okay, people are able to uh, accept it and they are not waiting for a laugh, you know, they are okay with smiling, okay, people are okay with smiling. See, that's one thing I always felt, and I'm I'm glad that it's 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 worked out well. I felt I people think. That a loud laughter is superior to a smile when mm. you are watching it, but it is not true, okay? Because mo- if you watch me watch Kirby Enthusiasm or uh, Modern Fa- even Modern Family, or The Office, you know these are th- things I like, or Silicon Valley. These four, I think, to me are the top. You you will think I'm watching some grim film, okay? Yeah. But I'm actually enjoying it, right? So I'm smiling inside, you know. Hmm. So I feel that uh, uh, loud laughter is not qualitatively superior to a smile in terms of experience. A smile, a smile is a great experience, you know. So a comedy like Decoupled, I'm always so kind. Of, I like it when people say that my I laugh so loud and all. That's great. That is all fine. Yeah. But uh to me uh, I, i if someone says that i was just smiling throughout okay i'll i'll understand that is that is the show that is the show yeah. okay you're smiling throughout right that's crazy i um, i even cried that i mean maybe this is just me and this does not apply to everyone else or maybe there's some in the last episode no huh? the, just some unconscious projection about you know things getting back together there's a little scene where they where um Shruti is fascinated by what Arya did for her. I'm not going to reveal what the scene is, mm. and and I was like, you know, this is this is nice. This is a union happening. There's some, yeah. Th- these are adults. They they know that their ship is sailed, but there's yeah. there's this real human moment there yeah. that um that really spoke to me. And yeah. and and if if a series can take you through that emotional roller coaster, yeah. which is you know idly what you look for in relationships, and yeah. and th- until then you arrive, finally you arrive at stability, then yes. it's all boring, right? Yes. If if it can do that, um. You come back transformed. Yeah. You started off as oh, my series. Dekna shuru karta hoon. By the end, you have the story kind of internalized, and it's still marinating, and it's still taking place, and there's still scenes playing in your head. And even as we're speaking today, some of the some of the some of the other parts that I did not know are still adding up together. And so it's it's taken a place in me, and I'm sure you know the viewers and the and everyone else who's even watched some parts of it are feeling the same. And I think that's a great thing because usually what happens is. um i've seen some series the action is too fast the protagonist is, is lackluster or it's just it takes like 8 9 10 seasons right and it just becomes like a cid like trope where there's always um a crime to solve these characters usually templatize their acting again and again and again but a lot of things happen and and by the end i didn't expect to have so many emotions right even feeling rage for that matter um at at the at ganesh the driver when like that 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 moment of tension when he's trying to speak to um the economist neighbor whose whose name of mr mr basu. das mr basu right that tension where i knew something bad was going to happen and and when it did happen i was like oh um but i mean uh, this is just me like as an admirer of the series i, I really enjoyed all of those moments mm. and, and and i'm glad that you know you were able to uh, get this project off of the ground and get yeah. netflix to support and madhavan yeah. It's, it's great um yeah it's uh, yeah it's uh, how do you, how it's are you filtering fulfilling. how are you filtering the feedback because it's coming from all directions yeah uh, have you arrived at that place where you're you know straight face when people say nice things or bad things yeah see i actually uh, i i'm used to feedback because for the la- because because i've been a journalist for so long yeah and uh, as a writer you are in a uh, over validated profession you know i feel that most people in this world are undervalidated like yeah. doctors you should try youtubing you'd be surprised 
Uh, you you you're an under validated professional over uh, over validated over validated okay yeah yeah, yeah. yeah it's, as it's writers we are like we're in yeah. this po- in this industry and i feel that all the validation which other people deserve like the technicians and the engineers bassists and bands yes you know on the drummer <laughs> yeah. you know uh uh we get it yeah. okay we have over validated right uh, which also means that initial initial stages you kind of uh, you get very irritated with criticism and all that but i've written three novels and I've, i mean every week i do a column and some of, some of the columns once hmm. or two you know they they go you know uh, i mean they 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 are very well received so uh, though the feedback to decouple is exceptional Hmm. okay it's exceptional um but uh, uh in spirit you know i kind of I, i i know how to deal with it you know um and uh, even the even some of the when i mean I'm kind of i feel that some of the reviews or uh, the in in the mainstream uh, of the couple was a disgrace to journalism honestly you know it's a disgrace because uh they, they had something personal against me and you take the columnist and you try to put it in the you know because a series is so many things you know a, right. f- a film is so many things yeah. right as uh but so it was uh, i would say because I, even as a journalist i was just disappointed every time i'm reminded why these guys become irrelevant why journalism becomes irrelevant because imagine 4 hours after five may you know like mainstream reviews yeah. the uh, actual viewers just make this made it, it just changed you know so yeah. it's like they don't even matter right and uh, their views completely different so i find i f- i i do at one level feel bad for uh, mainstream journalism hmm. at becoming so irrelevant and i know that i know why they're irrelevant because i have this thing i know in fact i plan to tweet i, I have this annual reminder to journalism <laughs> that if you pay peanuts mm. you'll get only actors okay so do you you know so you you're not able to qualitatively improve you know some of the things because you know there's only so much you have to offer so a particular kind of people are doing it and you know they're doing it for various reasons not for communicating you know not in pursuit of truth so all that thing is there you know but i uh, but the oh, reaction has been uh, uh quite terrific actually you know yeah. i expected this reaction okay because i always am never surprised a good things happening to me but i thought it'll take time to pick up you mm. know i thought it's going to take one or two months for people to figure it out okay yeah, like, and slowly and then you know yeah. but this instant thing you know is probably madhavan's uh, fame yeah because uh uh so many people just li- love madhavan okay and the way surveen has uh, looked in the series oh my god you yeah. know she's like uh, you know so uh, you know one of the most beautiful people in the world and then yeah. we have it in uh, decoupled and he's like sitting next to madhavan and we are like suddenly big right you know suddenly right. we are like you know so this is the like uh, it's like a giant was sitting behind a building you know yeah. and then suddenly he's got up you know uh so that is my analysis of why s- suddenly it has just taken off yeah. uh, it's not even been 6 days yeah i saw madhavan's instagram post or a twitter post where he said that i'm al- almost in tears because netflix it's trending on number 1 in india which is amazing because yes. you know you it has to be some kind of a giant series from the west or sacred games right not like a yeah. short short series with 28 minute episodes but you know and we're in english and in english right yeah. of all of all things <laughs> so that's incredible um I want to reference something that you mentioned a long time ago um in in in, res- in to add on to what you were talking about journalism in one of your articles you mentioned um the age of the the strong and silent has passed this is the age of the weak loud or the fragile loud hmm. Hmm. is is this what you mean by what is yeah ha- yeah. yeah it's the lament you know hmm. so what happens is that um uh there is a certain current in the wound hmm. right so the wound has become very uh, it's a great uh, it's a it's a great megaphone for thoughts ideas and and sometimes mediocrity you know uh, because uh, it travels fast now and uh, and others identify with the wound 
and they chant the same thing you know so it's become you know so i uh, so i feel that uh, uh, so i i i feel that you know so that is the that is a big shift mm. you know so now if you don't know what your wound is like let's say you're in communication right okay? by which i mean could be fiction journalism politics many broadcasting things. anything yeah if you don't know your wound uh you're not going to go very far right mm. unless you are very unless you have a certain integrity a lot mm. of talent and you want to do your stuff and then people yeah. you know you can also say that even comedy is also a form of aggression okay an aggressive yeah. expression of your own wound you know right. or your own search for your wounds or you know others you can yeah. but it's all around the wound yeah you know we have become that because we are full of ourselves we are megalomaniacs right so so we respond to that uh to the wound you know there's no other mm. better word for that you know right right you know i don't want to use geological terms that people use i don't know why you know mm. when you're talking about humans there's a wound so when you say wound you mean it's some kind of um, a complaint it could be a complaint hmm. it could be a lament yeah hmm? some kind of a neurosis <clears throat> a neurosis need not be need not be neurosis hmm. uh it is just a it could even be a grouse hmm. right? uh it could be you know so we need, need that you know to people people need that to communicate right so i feel that the whole generation like in fact young, young people get irritated when I, i i wrote a column on how this whole generation is filled with whiners you know uh, there was a time when people asked shut up you know so mm. I, like you know enough but uh, they they can go on and on and keep on whining and then yeah. it is okay and then the only defense they have is oh uncle shut up that's that's the yeah, and, and, and or whatever yeah, depending yeah, yeah. on their reference or whatever yeah, i don't think that makes sense because it it's like it it um it absolves them of the responsibility to look deep within and and see what the problem is i do agree that there's a lot of whining um especially around uh, politics and and i think uh younger people are just more activist from my own generation and less political like they have less political facts and more outrage that they want to express um oh chuck polnick has a very interesting idea around it where he says that you know these people have been stripped of power so they are they're finding whatever whatever they can to you know get some of it by um by status signaling or bringing other people down who playing other games um but taking that aside um uh, I wanted to ask you and you've been asked a bunch about writing rituals we'll do this and then one more and then we'll end um do you have like a note taking system that you use that you then um revisit and let ideas dwell up uh, to repackage later on in articles because I mean I know that you you wrote about divorce and marriages a bunch of times right um in mint so i'm just wondering do you flesh out ideas in your notes and what is your noting process in general look like yeah i mean nothing fancy i mean i am entirely notes yeah. you know i'm full of notes hmm. um use notion or like apple notes or oh no that's what i mean i i, I hmm. don't understand those things in the sense that i don't understand why the tools are so important hmm. okay as sort of people keep talking about tools and uh, i that's when i find this is something amateurish about the articulation of tools in my view hmm. okay uh my uh my system of note though as a consequence my my system of note taking is very inefficient okay right. but i i want that inefficiency uh, inefficiency because that makes me keep reading the same notes again and again okay interesting so i have my notebook and then i have a file it's just a apple uh, page file okay yeah and it's just a list of things and i don't One know why fire. i like sometimes i just stand and look at this people might be thinking i'm in some deep thought i'm thinking if this note should go right on top <laughs> of the thing or should it go right at the bottom should i press control a and press it down and yeah and to me i know that there is an importance to it and i don't know why but i'm thinking about it okay yeah. so it's a very inefficient system so people who give me advice on this kind of tools are correct but i yeah. want this inefficient because every week uh, because it's inefficient i have to read all my notes again because i'm searching for something yeah okay i have a separate thing called column ideas hmm. i have a separate thing called ideas i have separate thing called poems hmm. uh short stories okay there's separate things okay all on pages all on all on pages put yeah. it all in a folder and uh, so i have to keep on uh, 
going through them and i fine tune them and you know sometimes i discover something because of that mm. you know so it is inefficient yeah uh but i think most of the time i remember most of the things so it's just that the, once i have uh written a note mm. or keyed it in it just stays with me so most of the time i write it probably as a way of just remembering it right you know but if i don't write it down at that moment i would not uh, remember it okay if it's a passing uh, like for example recently i had this idea okay for if there is a season 2 i already notes or no hmm. i have so, so much material for five seasons okay this message is for netflix uh so uh i had one on uh, the way contemporary artists complement other artists is very corrupt okay hmm. you ask uh, Uh, I won't give too many details because yeah. I want to like uh, you ask uh, a writer or a singer or an actor who's the greatest contemporary who's the greatest actor of your time okay yeah so it leads to a very funny situation okay mm. and uh, and uh, I so most of the time I just my note is just just contemporary writers I know I know then what I'm talking about I know the whole arc you know so stuff like that if I had not written it down it would have not that it would have vanished from my head i wouldn't have made the connection later that this can be used in fiction hmm. okay that this is not a column thing so same thing with columns you know and even within columns there are various arguments most of the time i don't do most of my columns because i've not been able to argue well against it right you know? one thing i i noticed in your columns is you um, never cite anyone it's always it's, it's all <laughs> Yeah and and I was I thought that this kind of uh, journalism for the lack of a better word is dead. Uh but then I saw you doing it. Usually people use uh research papers or <laughs> or excerpts from interviews to to bolster their point. Yeah. Y- you have none of those. Yeah, it's a trick, you know. See like uh, if it is a particular kind of uh, uh journalistic space. Like I used to write the letter from India in the New York Times for 6 years. Hmm. That comes under dispatch. Okay, that came under there. reporting section it was not opinion so right. this is a substantiated comment that's what that is supposed to be there i would interview people hmm. i'd interview people uh supported with arguments and all that kind of stuff but in opinion i don't one i don't have to do it and two it's just a journalistic trick see anything you say anything you want okay any opinion okay any, be anything okay you will find uh, you'll be able to attribute it to someone <laughs> right okay it just like it's to me it has no meaning okay then i within that i will make you choose okay if you want to say whatever you know whatever you want to say okay it's like okay within that do you want a research paper do you want a academic's comment or do you mm. want an artistic guy's comment everything is available right okay and both sides both sides of the argument okay that's how so to me it's just a born. trick yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so it's a uh, sometimes when you have to be persuasive okay like it's a very difficult argument that you're making to because people are not going to see it like for example i don't know if you remember facebook was trying to in- introduce something called um, free basic which is free internet and, yes a while ago they were something huh? called internet neutrality which all these activists picked up on okay yeah, it was aib who was trying to do this do it here in india but it died down no no a- a- aib was, was for some reason the for some reason comedians go through a phase where we with the very consensus where they all say all the right things you know that was but internet but that is an extension of the internet neutrality phase right uh where the where, where aib supported uh, the campaign against uh, facebook right yeah. and i was i was taking the facebook side okay yeah. it was a difficult argument to make uh but for that i i i realize that nobody had read that academic paper from where internet neutrality term emerges okay mm. so then i thought it is useful to note that boss the guy who has given you this concept has said something okay and it is very different from what you are saying okay mm. and it is not theology that he himself says that it should not be the so internet neutral uh, net neutrality according to it like you 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 can't favor you know any particular app or company just because they are paying you more and you can't give them more speed and i was just saying this is not sustainable this morality is not sustainable okay and that's exactly what i found in the paper also and of course i you know because 
I, that's also a trick. I'm going. I'm, I'm taking the argument of a guy who supports my argument, hmm. correct? But still, uh, it was important in that context because net the paper which created the idea of net neutrality has not been read by the people who were the evangelists of net neutrality. Okay, it was evident to me from hmm. their argument, right? So in those cases, yes, I, uh, I mean, journalism trains you to be persuasive. It helps me in defending my screenplay also. Okay, like for example, I need to defend my screenplay. I know how to build an argument. Okay, without bullshitting, because I feel that most people in this world are not good at arguing, hmm. but they know when you're bullshitting. Okay, and I think it is a, it's a waste of everybody's time. Right. There is a way of arguing, without bullshitting. You know, so uh, so all those uh, things. You know, uh, yeah. Yeah, I, I, about that, I don't think people realize when they become evangelists of certain things, it's usually something they see on their social media feed, see a bunch of popular people tweet about it, and then that's how they unconsciously internalize the outline of whatever that thing is, and then they become the champions of that. Yes. I, I do think that in any kind of mass communication, all the mass communication is a bit outline, uh, on the outline as well, because I, I studied advertising. They didn't teach us how to research, but... um. Writing college essays um, for all kinds of humanities back then, they weren't as ideologized as they are now, um, allows you to delve deep into places that, you know, to origin documents, primary sources that, that usually people miss when they're trying to just make, you know, a lame argument on the internet. Um, and I think that's the difference that, that when, when you say something, you, you have a lot of pillars to stand on and, and you yeah. can, you can. Uh, there's there's a term that I picked up somewhere called uh, steel manning an argument. You can you can steel man on both sides. Uh, basically, make the strongest uh, point of the other side, and then and then attack it. So that yeah. that 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 that's how you're solid as well. Yes. Um, no, I'm, I'm bad hmm. at debating. Like for example, yeah. if you're on a TV debate, okay, yeah. on a subject, you know, so it's very impressive for hmm. someone quoting people, and they will be very persuasive than me. Right, like they can quote uh, this guy, that guy, you know, which I would think is completely unimportant in this context, and I will be speaking. So it's kind of it's. Uh, I think most people do it because it's impressive, hmm. you know, and they've started believing that that is the way to do it. But I also feel that most people can see. Uh, most people get actually irritated with so many quotes and comments, like they want to know what you right. think about it. Right? Yeah. Yeah, I, I don't know how they they have managed to love Tim Ferriss and uh, Maria Popova still then, because that's what all that's that's all what they do. Um, before we end, I want to ask you one more thing. Um, so there's a lot of, uh, and this is a spe special personal selfish question. Selfish question. Uh, I know a lot of young writers. I am one myself. Um, there's since form and structure are completely out of the window, thanks to Instagram and Twitter and screenshots. Anything goes, right? R writing has become so democratized that anyone can write, and that has uh, prevented most of us from following the same sort of rigor that you did maybe in journalism school, right? There's a lot of citizen writers who don't have training in research and formulating sentences in a certain way. What would you say to uh, young writers? Do you think it's helpful to have a a training in journalism to at least, no matter even if you're like a romantic poetry writer, do you think that that training that you had, would it help a lot of people? So I was trained in, chiefly in the profession of journalism. Okay. You know, not in a school as such. I mean, I went, hmm. went to a journalism school, but I didn't last long, three, four months. Yeah. Uh, what, see, what journalism does is, there are only, broadly for most young people, there are only two industries which will pay you for writing, journalism and advertising. Hmm. I think even today, do that, that. Is okay, but now I think young writers are able to join the writers room and the OTT platforms and all that with so many production houses making films and series. Um, so uh, I feel that you have to you have to choose your um, one important thing is I feel um, they get a lot of bad advice from writers. Chiefly, mm. I often hear writers. Uh, uh consecrating reading okay mm. uh 
which is good like especially for young people you read a lot vast wide hmm. yes okay but it is like a young cricketer being told watch videos watch videos of sachin watch videos of sachin i like he'll do it anyway naturally most you know he'll do yeah. it without you telling he, what a young cricketer has to do is play a lot all the time you know and writers should write all the time mm-hmm. what people never ask me okay is they always ask me what did you used to read or what did you read when you were 18 20 20 yeah recommendations they never ask me what you wrote i mm-hmm. wrote a lot of stuff okay and people even now they are asking like how do you write i i i started writing screenplays in my late teens Hmm. because i want to make a movie next year next year it never happened okay i came to bombay i wrote lots of screenplays okay all these friends who trying to make movies and the only guy whose time is expendable is the writer so you sit and write and others are having a drink and uh, whatever and they kind of oh it didn't work we didn't get the money because they you know then you move on to but you keep writing yeah. you keep writing and all those all those uh years of loneliness sitting in my room and writing and hoping you know it's kind of it helped me well the you know i i i like the logic of a screenplay now even in my novels i like the scaffold that uh, scaffolding you know i'm not a i i you know it's like that meandering storytelling i don't see hmm. the point of it right yeah so uh, so i feel that uh, once they know I mean if you're a writer you can write all forms you know there would be one particular form which you know there's a, actually one of the most underrated novelists is a singer Leonard Cohen hmm he's written actually quite quite a good debut novel i think it's called beautiful people uh, i don't know, it's called beautiful people uh, we'll find a way to reference yeah, that in the video yeah yeah, yeah 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 okay So he makes an interesting comment. I say as a creative person like we get bogged down, bogged down by format, right? Hmm. Like what are you you know screen editor, novelist this. Right. Actually a writer is a writer, you know, just like T20 test, you know, like a Virat like if you if you're talented you can play all sides, okay? If right. you're kind of a slightly more political, you know, then you are in this you get uh, to play test just for stone walling, you know, for thousand balls. I don't understand that, okay? That thing about test cricket and stone walling. Yeah. but i'm saying generally talented uh, sports people will 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 do well in all formats similarly uh, writers now what leonard cohen said was this i did all kinds of stuff but then uh, music paid me the most so i that became this i stuck so you can you can see the humor and beauty of his lyrics even in his book okay it is mm. just as a more difficult uh, format than music yeah okay. music is far more accessible it's more it's accessible instant. because it has the full backing of melody right of, yes. of many other things mm. and it is not just a poem but what is writing is a poem hmm. which is now going to be transmitted to millions who are not interested in poems because of music right mm. so when he found that he said that it made it made me money right so i could express myself and uh, i became that i you know i became that and that's what happens to writers you do you can do many things and it and depends on the time see i have i've not written a novel for the last 2 3 years because i was working on a screenplay okay it's just what what is available and you're not compromising your same ideas okay you're expressing yourself you know in similar ways so uh, so i feel that uh, uh, they they need to write ev- uh, a lot and then figure out which format is sustaining them hmm. you know financially financially if that is important hmm. okay if if you have a rich dad i don't think anybody should hold it against you hmm. okay in fact it's a great idea for artists to make money in other fields and then you know uh follow your craft There's something arnold uh, schwarzenegger says you know that when he wanted to become an actor uh, a friend of a friend was telling me that uh, Arnold says that I f- I realize I have to first make money, hmm. and then he built the contacts, and then he became an actor. He didn't make money from acting first, yeah. of course. Now, eventually, he did, but he made it first as a business person, and then you know. Uh, but that need not be everybody's story. Uh, I feel there's so many opportunities. It's quite, quite an exciting time to be young if you're not an activist uh, who's stuck in a, a fake 
uh, news outlet okay yeah. that is the most depressing thing to be right now to be young and mm. to have a fake ideology run by dinosaurs okay and asking you to spew out ideology yeah. which you're too young to have you know yeah so uh, but otherwise it's so exciting there is this and that and you know, do your stuff yeah on your on your last comment i i, I can't he- help but make this comment um i was at jnu for a friends gig i've never been to the campus before in my life um and there was this young poet very strong words very passionate but he was lauded on for all the law- wrong reasons and i could hear some of the chants that these guys were doing at at the at the college and i mean i won't say them on camera but i I was just surprised because I've never been into JNU or DU for that matter but it was a cluster fuck of ideology on the inside just just and and this this young kid is 17 and he's being lauded by all these adults that he's doing the right thing so he's saying more inflammatory stuff yeah right um and I and I had a talk with him because what he was saying is uh these these boys in rich cars don't know what it feels like to be me and then he asked for a lift I happen to be a boy in a rich car. I was like, so you were saying that? No, 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 I didn't mean you. Like, this is exactly the point. You're, you're trying to appease to all of these people out here who you think are doing the right thing and you're losing your bachpan, your, your jawani in that. Um, but yeah, that was just an aside that uh, I wanted to bring up. People can watch Decoupled on Netflix. Uh, it's out. Uh, I think it was on two, number two yesterday trending in India and then a couple of days ago it was number one. Um, people can also follow you on Instagram. Uh, Manu Joseph A N, uh, right? You use an A N at the end as well. S A N. Manu Joseph San. San. That's a. Yeah. So Japanese. Japanese. Uh, show. Yeah. But uh, I I didn't get my handle, so I just. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Instagram is like <laughs> that, and then Twitter as well. Hey, thank you so much for doing this. Uh, I had a blast. I hope you had a blast as well. Thank you so much. I loved our conversation. Thanks a lot. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you.